Финансик, по който работи консорциум от 9 организации от 7 държави с фокус по-голяма прозрачност, гражданско участие и справедливост при разпределението на европейски средства. Сред целите му е настояването за не само зелена, но и справедлива трансформация. И наскоро изледналият доклад, на който може да видите корицата на екрана, възстановяването след COVID-19 не е възможно без гражданско участие, който също така се и фокусира върху включването на обществеността и това, че тя има ключово значение за зелената трансформация на Европа. А всъщност разкрива как липсата на обществен контрол е довела до вредни инвестиции в седем държави членки на Европейския съюз. Казусът от България е една инвестиция от националния план за възстановяване и устойчивост за финансиране на възобновяеми енергийни източници при домакинства, което е мярка в правилната посок за увеличаване на дела на чиста енергия при крайните потребители и увеличаване на енергийната независимост. Но при изпълнението се изключва енергийно бедни домакинства от процеса. Линк към доклада и видеото, което описва казуса, има в сайтовете на Заземята и Бенкоч, в случай, че имате интерес да се запознаете. Сега да минем към програмата на вебинара. Всъщност по този повод ние организираме този вебинар, в който експерти от Европа и България ще споделят опит за справянето с енергийната бедност и какви са спецификите в България. Говорителите са Франческа Канали, която е EU Policy Officer от CE Bank Watch Network за Централна и Източна Европа. Тя ще сподели за различните подходи за справяне с енергийна бедност в Европа. Петослав Стойков, експерт енергийна ефективност, екологично сдружение за земята, с темата за сградно обновяване и как мрежата обслужване на ногише би могла да ускори зеления преход в жилищния сектор. И Теодора Пенева, главен асистент в Института за економически изследвания на Българската академия на науките, която ще представи националните специфики, предизвикателства и прогрес при въвеждането на механизма за намаляване на енергия и на бедност в България. Другата причина да изберем тази част от годината за разглеждане на темата за енергия и на бедност е това, че тя е явление не само през студените месеци, а и през лятото, когато не можем да охладим адекватно жилището си. Също защото сега е благоприятно време за сградна реновация и защото в момента има отворени програми на национално ниво за финансиране на инсталации за възобновяем енергийни отличници за домакинства. И така давам думата на първия ни говорител, Франческа Канали, която ще сподели какви са различните разбирани подходи за справяне с енергийната бедност в Европа. Франческа. Благодаря много. Да, можете да ме слушаш? Да. Благодаря, Ива. Благодаря много за интродукцията и благодаря на всички. Uh, my name is Francesca Canali and uh, I'm a EU policy officer at Bankwatch. Uh, so today I will uh, guide you through the different approaches that exist at the EU level across the EU member states uh, in tackling energy poverty. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first I will give you a very short introduction on the topic on the issue of energy poverty and then I will um, explain what is the EU approach uh, regarding tackling energy poverty to go then go uh, to see what is the approach of the EU member states and share with you some good practices that we have recently identified uh, across the EU member states and especially in CEE countries. Next slide please. 
So just a few words about Bankwatch. Um, CE Bankwatch Network is a network of environmental groups uh, in Central and Eastern European countries um, monitoring uh, the use and misuse of EU funds um, in terms of uh, uh, environment, climate and energy uh, targets. We are active in eight countries in the CEE region, plus we do collaborate with the southern countries uh, as well. Uh, so you will see an example from Italy in this presentation. Uh, and in Brussels, where I am based, we uh, work together with the European institutions and with other stakeholders uh, on topics um, related to the energy transition, including energy poverty. Next slide, please. So recently we released this briefing, which was published last month on tackling energy poverty in the EU member states, uh, where, we, um, where we reflected on the concept of energy poverty, the issue, what is the level of awareness at the moment at the EU level, and again, what is the um, perspective of the member states. As I'm sure you are very familiar with the issue, um, energy poverty is a situation in which households are unable to access essential energy services and products, uh, or uh, more easily defined when citizens struggle to maintain adequate heating in their homes. But as Eva was saying, energy poverty doesn't re only refer to the winter time. Uh, we are facing uh, uh, extremely hot weather and uh, the situation is likely to increase um, in terms of heat waves all around Europe. Uh, so we need to start talking more about summer energy poverty. So uh, not only suffering from the cold, but also enduring the heat. Uh, because energy poverty, as we know, is not only about paying for bills, is a, a, a problem of health. It has many, many consequences is also on our health. Uh, so we really need to start addressing the problem um, in all levels. Next slide, please. Uh, recently, the European Union's Eurostat, which is the statistical office of the EU, released the data uh, for energy poverty from 2021. 70% uh, of the EU citizens suffered from energy poverty, and unfortunately, the last, largest share is in Bulgaria, 24%. I will then leave my colleagues to dive into the Bulgarian situation. But just to say that the number 70% for the overall EU is likely to be worse for 2022. We don't have data yet for last year. However, we know that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has contributed to uh, increasing the energy prices, there was inflation, and the cost of living rocketed, skyrocketed. So uh, overall, uh, we do not have the data, but we do expect uh, an increase in the number 70%. But the question is, who is responsible with energy poverty, with implementing policies uh, that tackle energy poverty? Uh, well, the answer is the member states. Um, the responsibility lies with the EU member states. There is no common EU approach, and the role of the European institutions is to guide and support the member states to implement efficient energy policies. So in the next few slides, I will show you what is the EU approach, how is the EU uh, uh, guiding the member states to implement good policies. Uh, next slide, please. So we have two sets of instruments at the EU level. The first set is the legislative instruments. I mentioned here two uh, relevant, two, the two most relevant directives dealing with energy poverty. Um, both of which have recently been amended. Um, the first one is the Energy Efficiency Directive, the so-called EED, uh, which was adopted by uh, the Parliament, European Parliament, in the last plenary, and it's now uh, it now needs to be adopted by the Council as well. Anyway, the new uh, Energy Efficiency Directive, uh, which was again recently amended by the institutions. Um, introduced a definition of energy poverty in Article 2 of the, uh, of the directive. Um, you can find the definition here, and as you can see, it refers to both heating and cooling, again, to go back to the concept of summer energy poverty. Uh, but uh, 
sorry. Uh, but um, at the other um, introduction that was uh, included in the new energy efficiency directive is also this article 22, uh, whose title is empowering and protecting vulnerable consumers and alleviating energy poverty, where um, basically uh, the EU institutions are encouraging the member states to use um, the available public funding provided by the European Union to tackle the issue, um, they are encouraging the member states to implement energy efficiency measures and to um, have some technical assistance to support uh, the households in uh, renovation of their apartments to go, uh, sorry, their homes to go again in line with the um, energy efficiency measures. The second um, uh, directive uh, that I'm mentioning here is the Energy Performance of Building Directive. This was also recently amended, but it's still being uh, negotiated in uh, the uh, negotiations between the Parliament and the Council. However, uh, we can say that the Energy Performance of Building Directive is very relevant in terms of energy, uh, energy poverty because it's the plan to renovate the building stock uh, across the EU and uh, it addresses one of the root causes of energy poverty, meaning that if we have energy efficient buildings, then we have warmer houses and lower bills. Uh, so um, good implementation of the energy performance of building directive will uh, lead to less energy poverty across the EU. The um, next uh, point in this slide that I uh, that needs to be highlighted in terms of EU initiative is the Social Climate Fund. Um, the Social Climate Fund is not operational yet, but it will be as of 2026. Uh, so um, uh, the member states will be able to use the Social Climate Fund to address the impacts, the social impacts uh, from the extension of the emissions trading system. So the emission trading system already exists, but it's now being extended to road transport and buildings. And this will likely to have a very big impact on the already um, vulnerable households. So the Social Climate Fund is a fund targeting the most vulnerable households and people that are already suffering from energy poverty to support them in um, providing the funding for uh, structural measures uh, and investment in the energy transition, such as energy efficiency. Again, this is not operational yet, but it will be in three years from now. Next slide, please. Here I um, included all the known legislative instruments that are um, that are put forward by the European Union. So these are uh, again um, measures through which uh, the means through which the European Union is trying to uh, guide the member states and to also in in, in increase their. Um, coordination and the coordination of the measures. Um, you see that we have a recommendation on energy poverty, which was released in 2020 uh, to define the indicators that member states should use when measuring energy poverty. We have a hub and we have a coordination group. Um, again, all platforms are set up by the European Union with the aim to ensure that the member states are implementing efficient measures. One thing that I will, wanted to tell uh, in this webinar is that last week um, at an event um, hosted by the European Economic and Social Committee, the European Commission said that they will release a new recommendation on energy poverty this year at the end of October. Uh, so we will have a new one three years after the first one, uh, which um, will, uh, let's say, um, take into consideration all the big changes that have happened since 2020. Next slide, please. So the, this was um, the perspective of the EU, the EU institutions and what they can actually do to uh, tackle energy poverty. But going into uh, more detail, in our briefing, we analyze how five EU member states uh, are tackling energy poverty, and this allowed us to uh, reflect on what are the existing measures uh, at the moment at the EU level uh, fighting energy poverty, and which are the best practices among them. We analyzed uh, five countries, as I said, 
So we have Czech Republic, Italy, Latvia, uh, Poland, and Slovakia. And in uh, um, later in the presentation, I will give some examples that are also available in our briefing. But what we've noticed is that there are four types of measures that the member states implement to fight energy poverty. Uh, and they are listed here. As you can see, some of them are short terms, um, like a band aid approach. However, we also have um, long term measures that would um, uh, have an effect on energy poverty by uh, fighting the root causes, just like uh, the directive that I mentioned earlier. So energy efficiency, promoting energy efficiency, uh, renovating the buildings to make them more energy efficient is key. Uh, in uh, uh, fighting energy poverty and in um, in avoiding uh, the rise of energy poverty. Uh, and also, of course, integration of renewable energy sources in the um, promotion of energy efficiency. Next slide, please. This is um, a graph that we uh, created with uh, the best practices that we found uh, analyzing uh, our uh, these the countries that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are uh, according to to our analysis uh, uh, the best practices to uh, help the um, alleviation of energy poverty. So as you can see. We have the building renovation, but uh, we also have measures supporting. Uh, households uh, to apply for renovation measures and subsidies for low income households. This is a very important point because, of course, uh, we need to understand who is energy poor and we need to see how to help those who are energy poor. And then uh, technical assistance and information assistance plays a key role in helping, again, those who are in need of support to actually be informed and uh, apply, for instance, for these uh, subsidies. Next slide, please. So these are the examples that I wanted to mention. Um, again, you will have uh, you will be able to have more examples in the briefing, but these are um, particularly good uh, practices that we were able to identify uh, in our analysis. I would first of all like to mention the Czech Republic's um, new green savings life program, which is funded from the Modernization Fund, and uh, it comes in uh, grants up to 100% for building renovation improvements for the most vulnerable citizens, meaning uh, senior citizens and low-income households. A similar um, program is the Slovak program, uh, which is, let's say, smaller in terms of scale uh, and in terms of funding. Uh, it's about uh, 80 million uh, euros from the recovery and resilience facility and from the modernization fund. And this also supports the renovation of homes uh, for um, disadvantaged households to apply for 100% of eligible costs for partial renovations. The target here, here, as I said, is a bit smaller. We're talking about 1,600 households, but it's a very similar program uh, to the Czech one. Then I would like to mention Italy, so a southern country, a southern European country. Uh, here we have two measures. The first one is the so-called super bonus. Again, with, um, the money here, uh, the funding comes from the recovery and resilience facility. And we're talking about uh, 18 billion euros to encourage households and homeowners to renovate uh, their, um, their homes. Uh, here we have uh, um, a tax deduction. So basically the homeowners are able to apply for a tax deduction of 110% uh, for the expenses uh, of the renovation. So this is again another scheme whose goal is to encourage uh, the owners to apply for the renovation uh, in, in times of energy crisis. But the second one is also, um, I, I wanted to include it in this presentation because it's also a very good practice that we find uh, uh, that we saw in um, the Lazio region. The Lazio region is the region of Rome. Uh, basically, um, it's about energy communities. So, so uh, this is really um, a key uh, case uh, showing how 
uh, yeah, the, the link between energy communities and energy poverty, because in the Lazio region, energy poverty is considered as a valid criterion for the allocation of public funding. And in the, um, in the call uh, for proposal, it's also uh, mentioned as a priority. Energy poverty is a priority of the energy communities of the Lazio region. So again, uh, energy communities and the link between uh, the energy communities and energy poverty. Next slide, please. And now I can conclude my presentation with the recommendations and conclusions that we produced from our analysis. So these are um, what uh, we identified as key uh, recommendations for the member states and their decision makers uh, across the EU. So uh, building from what we um, analyzed as tendencies and approaches uh, in all EU countries, um, especially in the CEE region. So first of all, we would encourage the member states to use the funding opportunities that are provided by the European Union uh, to implement policies addressing energy poverty. In the previous slide, I mentioned the modernization fund, the recovery and resilience facility. There is an, a big, big opportunity to implement uh, um, energy efficiency investments um, with the new Repower EU chapters that countries are still drafting, uh, but we also have cohesion policy funds. So um, the, the member states should use the funding opportunities uh, to implement uh, measures that are actually uh, fighting energy poverty. How? By setting more ambitious energy efficiency targets that are in line with the new energy efficiency directive and that can bring a long-term solution against energy poverty. Of course, um, special focus and attention should be given to uh, the most vulnerable consumers. As I said, uh, some slides um, in some slides, some of my slides, there should be uh, special instruments for the most uh, disadvantaged people, allowing them to actually access funding from home renovation. Uh, and finally. One uh, very important point is raising awareness about the issue of energy poverty. Um, it's, it's, it's not uh, nice to say, but the energy crisis increased the awareness of energy poverty also at the EU level. Um, the, the, for instance, this event at the Economic and Social Committee that happened last week is the third one. So it started in 2020 uh, and uh, it, it's getting bigger and bigger. It's um, getting, it's, pressing issue is getting more and more recognized at the EU level. Uh, so uh, let's hope that this recognition also brings to better uh, measures and uh, the implementation of uh, long-term solutions. And I can conclude here. Of course, I will, uh, I will be happy to reply to some questions later if there's any. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francesca, for giving us the European perspective of the issue with energy poverty and seeing um, some examples of how countries are actually uh, targeting the issue. Now we can move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, we have Svetoslav Stoikov, who is a uh, um, member of, of Friends of the Earth Bulgaria, and he is going to share with us a little bit more on the building innovation in Bulgaria, zooming in a little bit into the national context and um, how could the one-stop shop initiative accelerate the green transition in the housing sector? Svetlo, over to you. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, it's really nice to, uh, to have you all here and I will just uh, really um, speed up through this presentation because we uh, didn't have uh, a lot of time and there is so much to say actually and uh, then in the discussion afterwards uh, I hope that there's, there are going to be uh, quite a lot of interesting questions so I want to really to uh, leave more time for, for discussion. Uh, so the thing is that uh, um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the progress uh, that we see in uh, the field of uh, energy renovation in Bulgaria in the domestic sector and uh, uh, to talk also a little bit about the one-stop shop uh, reform in Bulgaria and basically to explain a little bit what one-stop shop is for the uh, ones of you who are not really familiar with it. Uh, so next slide, please. 
Uh, so just uh, very uh, briefly, I have summarized um, the most important statistics here. And uh, um, the interesting thing is that uh, um, nearly 93% of the existing residential building stock is deemed to be energy uh, inefficient in Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, actually, we have quite a lot of buildings to, to renovate, multifamily buildings and single family buildings. Uh, and uh, there is a goal that we have set uh, for um, up to 2030 for a minimum of 12,000 multifamily buildings to be renovated and 16,000 single family uh, family buildings. And the thing is that uh, um, the progress is really slow that you can see uh, uh, in the past uh, uh, years, uh, for more than 10 years, uh, only uh, 2,800 multifamily buildings, they were uh, renovated. And now with this new program from uh, the uh, Recovery and Resilience Plan, uh, around 1,000 more uh, are expected to be renovated. And the thing is that we have a, um, a set target of renovating 3% uh, of our um, building stock, residential building stock uh, per year of the floor area, not the building stock, but the floor area. So the thing is that you can see that we are uh, really uh, lagging uh, behind uh, in, uh, in, those in these targets, and uh, this is just what I wanted to uh, show you here. And uh, some of our colleagues from uh, the NGO sector, uh, from other organizations that are working in the field, are saying that uh, it is going to take us, um, with the pace that we have right now, that is going to take us more than uh, 200 years to renovate our existing building stock. Uh, so next slide, slide please. And uh, in this slide and in, in the next one, I just I really want to show that there is a huge, uh, really, really huge potential for energy savings. And the thing is that uh, um, this is uh, this is a graph that uh, that we can see here, which is uh, which I took from uh, one um, of the papers of uh, Renovate Europe, and it is showing that Bulgaria actually it is um, probably one of the two. Uh, countries in the most uh, um, dire um, situation around um, around the situation with the energy efficiency of the um, of the building stock, but but this is exactly why we have a really really huge potential to renovate our buildings. And next slide, please. And uh, this is one more slide, which is from another report. And it is, uh, you can see uh, Bulgaria on the graph, like uh, just uh, on the right-hand side, just next to Romania, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Cyprus. So the thing is that this is showing uh, the uh, potential uh, for um, savings coming from uh, residential heating. And residential heating, it's uh, the area that uh, it's basically uh, most energy consumption in a residential building. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, going for heating our homes during, uh, during the winter. So we can really see that we have a huge potential in saving um, here. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, so this is just, uh, I'm just going to focus a little bit uh, um, on two of the projects that we are, uh, that are featured in our recovery and resilience plan here, uh, here in Bulgaria. And uh, this is just um, a very, very uh, brief screenshot that I really want to, to show of the current situation, what is happening. We uh, had the first phase uh, of the project for energy renovation of multifamily buildings. Um, and now we are uh, we are having the second one. So um, already uh, documents uh, are being accepted. Uh, and the thing is that I'm not really going to focus on all of the details. We can just uh, discuss, um, discuss everything later on in time. I'm well aware that uh, a lot of our uh, participants that are here today with us are really 
um, they really know a lot of the details. Uh, but the thing is that what is the most important for me is that for the first time in quite a long time, we are introducing um, co-financing percentage. And uh, this co-financing uh, equals to 20% right now in this, in this current, current scheme. But uh, what is really important is that uh, there is there are no uh, available financial instruments for this 20%. So the thing is that um, somehow it seems that this program it's not really about uh, um, dedicated uh, like targeted at energy uh, in, in reducing energy poverty at all. Because the thing is that how could uh, um, a family uh, like uh, in the category of energy poverty could afford to finance these 20 resources, uh, these 20 percent. Uh, and uh, I feel that uh, the most vulnerable are really being excluded with, uh, with this. And um, actually, as I have uh, stated here on the slide, it is actually prioritizing, at least in my opinion, and in, actually in the opinion of uh, quite a lot of people that I have talked uh, talked with, it's uh, really prioritizing the middle and high income households. This this current current program, and of course, it is uh, uh, the project volume is slow. So the thing is that, as I showed uh, in one of the previous slides. Uh, bear, uh, around 1,000 uh, uh, multifamily buildings are going to be included. And um, uh, another important thing that I just want to mention for our viewers from abroad is that uh, we don't really have uh, um, right now um, such program dedicated to single family buildings uh, up to the present moment. So this is something that... Uh, I would really encourage encourage uh, uh, the people who are writing these programs to uh, to think about how we can just um, include the owners of the single family buildings here. And next slide, please. Uh, and this is the second uh, project that I uh, want to focus for a little bit. This is uh, about uh, support for renewable energy uh, sources for, for households. And uh, the scope, again, it's really low. It, it's uh, going to cover around uh, 10,000 households in Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, it is focusing on two things, on um, solar domestic hot water, so district um, domestic heat uh, um, domestic hot water systems and uh, photovoltaic systems and uh, the thing is that i'm again not really going to focus on the details but i really want to show um, again uh, something really important and that is that each applicant is required to finance the implementation with its own funds before uh, actually uh, and, and, and they sh should wait for approval. If they get this approval, eventually they're going to be reimbursed uh, up to 100% for uh, the um, uh, domestic hot water systems and uh, up to 70% for the photovoltaic system. But this again, it is uh, um, not really uh, applicable, this whole model, these whole things for um, uh, really the most vulnerable uh, groups of our society. Uh, and um, yeah, this is just what I wanted to show. And next slide, please. So uh, what are really uh, the key takeaways up to this present moment for me from the slides that I uh, just showed you? Uh, it is that the, uh, what I really want um, you to remember basically that, that the renovation rate in Bulgaria is really slow. Uh, and it is uh, um, actually we need to find ways how to uh, accelerate this renovation rate. And uh, currently, there are um, a lot of funds uh, like Repower EU chapters, modernization funds, and all of other things. All of our all, uh, a lot of available resources actually from the, coming from the EU that we could uh, basically use in order to accelerate this um, renovation rate. Uh, but we need to find a way how to um, use them in the best possible way. And uh, the second takeaway is that there is no national support for single family um, uh, buildings, single family households. 
uh, as I um, told you a little bit uh, earlier. And this is a really important aspect that we need to focus on to think how we can really um, offer something to uh, to these people. And there are quite a large percentage of the um, population of Bulgaria, actually. Uh, and uh, from what I'm seeing here is that um, there is no prioritization existing in Bulgaria. Uh, and this is basically partly due to the lack of comprehensive national definition that can be uh, effectively used. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Teodora, just in a bit, is going to tell you a lot about that. And uh, um, something that is really important is that also it's that 1% uh, 100% uh, um, funding uh, for, um, it was really a prevalent for the Bulgarian renovation programs uh, in the last uh, in the last years. And really right now we're introducing 20% uh, uh, co-financing rate. And the thing is that it is really important to see how this is going to go. Uh, if uh, we're going to go into the right direction or if we are going to fail in a certain way. Uh, so the thing is that it is also really important how this current program is going to continue continue, and if it is really going to uh, continue like uh, from uh, 2026, 2027, when this current program is finishing, or uh, basically we're going to see a large gap so a couple of years, five, six, seven, ten years up to the next renovation program in Bulgaria. So next slide, please. And uh, right now I'll try to be a little bit weaker because I took a long time. But uh, actually, what's a one-stop shop and how it could help us in order to... Um, accelerate this transition of building renovation and actually to help uh, alleviating uh, energy poverty to a certain extent. And uh, what is basically a definition of a one-stop shop? Uh, it is uh, um, a place where property owners are provided with information on renovation options, including energy efficiency, renewable energy sources, energy-related services, uh, and financing opportunities. And so there are a um, couple of uh, types for uh, major types of one-stop shops. One is the information one, coordination one, universal, and uh, um, ESCO model, energy service contracting. And they have uh, certain similarities and they have uh, um, certain differences too. Uh, but the thing is that in every single country in the European Union and sometimes even in uh, uh, the different regions of the same country, there are different models. And sometimes, and mostly it is one of these models or some combination of them. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and a little bit about the one-stop shop reform in the Bulgarian Recovery and Resilience Plan. Uh, what actually it was saying is that uh, um, uh, it basically aimed to establish six pilot regional one-stop shops for energy renovation till the end of uh, uh, last year. Uh, and this uh, sometimes did um, this somehow didn't didn't happen. And uh, the expansion to all 28 districts in the country uh, for the next 24 months, so till the end of 2024. And uh, um, of course, um, something that I that I want to mention here, and uh, mainly because uh, Teodora is here too, <laughs> it's uh, this uh, energy efficiency and energy poverty working group that was under the advisory council of the European Green, Green Deal. Uh, and uh, the thing is that we should have uh, been discussing uh, this reform over there, but somehow we. Uh, didn't uh, uh, didn't manage to do so due to certain uh, circumstances. Uh, so at the present moment, the re this reform uh, hasn't been uh, adopted or uh, implemented. So next slide, please. But of course, there is some light in the tunnel, and uh, uh, there are some people that I can see in the participants that are working hardly for the one-stop shop. Uh, uh, um, centers to actually to be to be active and to be informative 
and to be uh, all inclusive in a certain way. And so uh, um, right now there are several uh, one-stop shop centers in Bulgaria. There is a center uh, in Burgas, center in Gabrovo, one that I found just recently, it is in Brezovo, in a city near, near Plovdiv, at the center of Bulgaria. And uh, uh, most probably the largest one, it is the, um, the um, Center for Energy Efficiency, Sofia, which is uh, uh, located um, in Slatina municipality in, uh, in our capital. And what is really interesting, it, it's to, it is to see that they're financed by municipalities and or European projects, some combination about that. But actually, are they really operating uh, um, you know, cohesive, coherently? Are they talking between each other? Is there, uh, is there a network of one-stop shops in Bulgaria? Um, I don't really know. Maybe uh, Cveta Nanyuva could tell us a little bit more because I uh, see her uh, in the participants. And basically, um, she's probably the, um, the main person responsible for the Center for Energy Efficiency in Sofia. So next slide, please. And uh, yeah, just a couple of more minutes. Uh, so the thing is that uh, um, this is just uh, um, a graph from the report that I've seen. And uh, basically it is uh, using the traffic light system. And it is telling us where uh, in the different countries of uh, Europe, they are not all the countries in this report, but I think that there are 18 or 19 countries. Uh, there are uh, where there are one-stop shops existing and where there is country availability, countrywide availability of one-stop shops and where there is some kind of an online tools to help the citizens. And in Bulgaria, we see that there is no such things up to the present moment. And just some key factors for success for the one-stop shop in order to work, it's to be easily accessible to all, to uh, offer extensive informational package, to be transparent, and uh, independent to have qualified stuff working in there and uh, um, to have links with qualified contractors and uh, financial to link customers to financial institutions. So next slide, please. And uh, just very briefly, one study that we did on energy poverty here in Zazemiata uh, um, two years ago, and uh, uh, we focused on three uh, groups uh, in energy poverty. And we basically asked them a set of questions, and this, these are just uh, some of the important results here. And uh, what is really important for me, it's like uh, um, the main reason why the energy poor uh, people are not applying for uh, programs for building renovation, are uh, this uh, information deficit that they are not really uh, there is no one to help them uh, in order to uh, battle with the bureaucracy and the second thing is that uh, um, the more than 90 percent of the respondents uh, they uh, said that uh, they really view the one-stop shop reform as something that should happen and that they really uh, like the ideas to have uh, uh, um, energy consultants for free that they can just go and uh, tell their story and to have uh, information that could help them how to increase their uh, energy efficiency. So next slide, please. And basically that's... Uh, that's from me, and of course, I'm going to stay up, stay available for the Q&A. And of course, if you want to contact me, just write me on the email that is shown here. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Svetlo, for sharing um, your experience and knowledge on the uh, building renovation in Bulgaria and the interesting surveys that you did. Now moving on to Teodora Peneva, uh, who is going to share with us what are the national uh, specifics, uh, challenges and progress in the implementation of energy poverty uh, reduction mechanism in Bulgaria. Teodora, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Well, um, I'll start directly with the national specifics and uh, bring a little bit the enthusiasm down because uh, 
there is something very difficult. There are some very difficult challenges to overcome in the in Bulgaria and the, I guess in the countries in the region. Um, Eva, please let's start the presentation with the next slide. These are the contents. I will present talk briefly first the specifics, then how we address the specific with the, the energy poverty definition proposition we have because we don't we haven't adopted it yet. And then uh, what are the challenges and opportunities with applying the definition? So uh, when we have the three pillars of energy poverty, low income, high prices, and poor energy efficiency buildings, building stock. I'll start with the first one and the, and the, uh, the extent of, of it with the minimum wage, which you can see this, these are uh, data from January, 2022, but uh, we just had the, new, the newest data from July. 2023 and there is no much difference in the in the graph on the right side you can see bulgaria on the top with 332 euro per month and then luxembourg at the end i just don't want to mention numbers you can see the, the times how many times difference it is on the next slide uh, we can also see uh, because minimum wage is not average wage. So we can also compare average wages and it's it's more or less the same situation. Um, we are, you can see it's not only Bulgaria, the entire South, uh, Southeast and Central East Europe is having this problem. Uh, but uh, of course we are among the, the highest indicators again, in terms of average hourly labor cost. It's eight euro per hour in Bulgaria, the lowest one. It's same for a single person and for couples with two children. It's always the minimum. Uh, and something else that is very important is an indicator that low wage earners in Bulgaria are 21% of total, one fifth, which is really a big number. And uh, to be honest, uh, it's uh, this number is the official number. We have no idea how much of this is uh, in fact. Uh, you can, um, by the way, everyone can check the link in the presentation later on and check the real numbers for all countries. It's a really good statistic that was just uh, uploaded, uh, but it's very representative. It's, I don't know, it's six or eight times lower income than, than the highest one. It's a huge difference. And on the next slide, uh, we can also check uh, the, the net earnings, the annual net earnings in, uh, in nominal uh, <clears throat> units. And uh, you can see uh, Bulgaria and Romania on the very right side. Uh, I cannot, I don't know, I cannot show it, but you can see it on the very right side. And again, the difference is you can see the euro units on the on the scale on the vertical axis. So uh, I won't go into details because there is much more to say than the income. Well, of course, we have low income. It's very difficult for all these people to cover any type of long-term investment to decrease energy poverty. And on the next slide, you can see why uh, it's not only the income is low. Uh, again, Bulgaria and Romania on the right side. This is the expenditure structure of household by income quintil. Uh, quintil. For each country, we have three different groups. On the very left is the group of the lowest income people. They always have larger share of costs. Green cost is for food. Then we have blue uh, blue color for energy, for housing cost, and then uh, light blue for energy, for transport. And then we have uh, yellow for non-energy, uh, residential goods and services in violet. So you can see that uh, Bulgaria and Romania on the left side, on the right side, we have about 70% for food and energy and not much 
for services. So if you ask us to invest in energy efficiency, in building renovation, and long-term investment, we need to take that tiny part, the violet part, and invest somehow. You know, there is a huge difference. Um, on the next slide, something more. Um, uh, something else that is also uh, comparable between the countries in the EU is uh, the um, member states specific energy consumption relevant to the ETS2. The, this is something that will create the future social climate fund. And you can see the consumption in Bulgaria. I intentionally put a red arrow to, to show how much will be taxed. The good news is that we won't be able to contribute a lot, but the bad news is that we won't be able to invest a lot. <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, in both directions uh, a problem because uh, if uh, there is a comparison of the social climate fund, that uh, it's the tail, but we need to look the, the, uh, of the dog and we need to look at the head of the dog to see how big it is it cannot be too big you know if the head is small and this is the head in bulgaria it's quite small because uh, and this is on the next while, uh, slide uh, this is the next specific we have a very uh, high usage of fire this is why we don't have much to contribute to the social climate fund because it will be mainly taxes for gas uh, coal and uh, you know liquids that we don't use much as households uh, this is a problem but uh, this is creating something else as problems of course uh, the, the clean air and uh, also the, also we have very high prices of fire right now even higher than gas uh, people have to uh, to deal with uh, energy poverty on their own so they had, they're very quick in switching fuel and just because of the dynamics of prices, but of course, always with very low investment. It's not switching to renewable um, fuel, it's not switching uh, energy sources, and it's not switching to energy efficiency, you know, to equipment that is uh, lowering the, the quantity of consumption. So um, there is a price for this. So basically, we have very high share of the population being energy poor with this low income. And uh, Svetlo also mentioned and showed some percentages in the presentation of the, of the very low efficiency of uh, the building stock in some red columns. <clears throat> uh, it's about 92% of the buildings with class EFG. We have very low start, 3 to 5% being completely renovated. Uh, buildings. Uh, we have high home ownership in Bulgaria. This is also a problem because um, actually people that are poor are owners. They cannot invest in the renovation of the house uh, because they rent out the apartment or because they have lower cost. No, they cannot. Um, and then also some larger share of people live in individual houses. So far, we had only two programs. Uh, you you were just acquainted with the renovation program. So uh, it's very limited scope, only for multifamily buildings. Uh, and individual houses are homes of the majority of uh, energy poor families. So we have a very uh, big complexity of the causes of energy poverty. And at the same time, uh, we have, uh, so this is creating very high administration burden if you want to uh, to administrate uh, policies and measures for this big group. And I think this is something all that all countries uh, meet in future. Either they select, they choose to have a very limited and very tiny, uh, narrow definition of energy poor families, or in the case of Bulgaria, we can see on the next slide, we suggested we suggested a definition that can cover, this is how we selected the indicator for the definition, that will cover much more uh, people that cannot invest in long-term um, solutions 
for energy poverty. You can see uh, we made some comparison with different indicators. Of course, this is the energy approach, expenditure approach. We are not uh, uh, sympathizing the, the subjective approach that Eurostat uses uh, where when we compare 24% of Bulgarian people to 7% of European people being energy poor. We think that this indicator, first, it's subjective approach. It's not the objective one. And second, it's talking about running costs. But when we talk about energy poverty, we need to consider also investment costs. So uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see what we, requirements we consider to select this uh, indicator. Uh, this is how uh, this is the, the definition we suggested to be able to to address the problem uh, more efficiently is to include a typical energy consumption in the formula and uh, uh, extract it from the disposable income to to see or. Uh, now, if this income after energy expenditure is lower than the official poverty line. And on the next slide, uh, you can see how we, uh, um, well, okay, the specifics of this indicator are that it covers about 35 to 40% of the population, much higher percentage than the 24% of people usually state. Uh, it covers uh, mainly the lowest income groups and has uh, near zero coverage among the high income CEO groups. Uh, it's very important that it combines, uh, it has quantity, uh, measuring the energy quantity in, in it. It's not just applying a scale for the different families, but it has the quantity for different family. In this way, we can, we can be sure that we have the most uh, effective and also fair way to address the problem on the next few slides, Eva I will uh, ask you to go quickly uh, on the next slides because it's more about the formula and I think this is some sort of solution, but uh, it's very specific and we don't need to spend much time on it. These are the building times uh, types uh, we divided well uh, on the previous slide actually, just quickly to see the components uh, of the formula. We have, uh, you can see in yellow here, each building type has specific annual consumption. And we applied uh, per square meter uh, to know what's the consumption for the building. On the next slide, uh, you can see uh, how uh, we apply the, this number to, uh, to the household type. One person uh, has a standard uh, living area, 40 square meters, and if they have some old people, kids, or disabled people, then this uh, area is a bit higher to uh, address the specific needs to consume more in the winter when people stay 24 hours at home. Um, this is a simplified way to measure it. On the next slide, you can see, um, you can see how the consumption uh, differs for different types of buildings and for different family types. Uh, you can see that there is a huge difference and I think that these are the real numbers when we address some measures that we want to quantify them. On the next slide, just quickly to finish with this definition, uh, let's go over it. It's uh, the macro way to monitor it. It's even more simplified but again, it considers the floor area, the household size, and the annual price. In this way, we can guarantee that uh, when prices go up immediately, we have quick overview of the coverage of the higher coverage of energy poor people. And next, on the next slide, it's this is the scope. So we have very vulnerable people that receive heating allowance right now, about uh, 300,000 people in Bulgaria or uh, 5 to 7%. And then we have a uh, population below the official poverty line, 1.5 million people or 20% of the population and energy poor people at uh, 2.8 million uh, or 40% of the population. On the next slide, uh, it's uh, the challenges we face with uh, with the energy in 
poverty definition introduction. The biggest problem was how the government would administrate so many people. Mm -hmm. um, no one of the ministries uh, wants to administrate. Uh, at the end, we decided to use an information system that we do the uh, uh, that we will take the data for uh, household uh, incomes and uh, houses specifics, and then using the formula we will apply the official energy prices, the price for electricity, and we will give the output to the administrators of programs. But right now we have a problem that no one wants to administrate this information system, even if it's simplified. So we don't have a single competent organ to design the policies and measures. Each ministry says that this is not their problem. Um, the energy ministry says that it's a social problem. The social ministry says that it's an energy problem. I guess this is the same situation in most countries, but uh, even now, uh, because of not having definition, we are missing more opportunities in the future. So uh, the financial support, uh, Svetla already mentioned, uh, is, is uh, provided without any consideration vulnerable and energy poor groups. Even it doesn't apply the current mechanism that is used to provide heating laws. And next, on the next slide, so we very much miss all these opportunities. With the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, uh, the money that are invested are provided either to all people, regardless of their income, or only to, as Svetlou mentioned, middle class and high, uh, middle income and high income groups that can invest in uh, renewable equipment. The decarbonization fund, we have no idea of it, if uh, the ministry will include uh, specific components uh, for families, for households, or for energy poor households. We very much hope of it. But um, all other funds, uh, we will be able to to be more effectively effectively allocated if we have the mechanism. And it seems that it's very far away from us, maybe not even this year. I hope I'm wrong. So this is it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Teodora, for sharing with us the national specifics on the energy poverty situation here in Bulgaria. Okay, now we can move on to the questions. I see here that in the Q&A uh, tab, we have one question from uh, Violeta Kiremetsheva. Uh, do you think one-stop shops could exist as partnership projects between private entity and municipality or an NGO and municipality? Uh, are municipalities with one-stop shops proven as most efficient in renovation wave initiatives? Uh, and then she has a clarification while she's asking those questions uh, that the problem with many Bulgarian municipalities is that uh, they're not motivated enough uh, and maybe such partnerships could, in could improve the efficiencies. Uh, who would like to answer that? I feel like maybe it will be Svetlo considering that he uh, presented the one-stop shop initiative. Uh, yes, I will briefly answer answer this. And actually, I showed you um, four different types of uh, one-stop shops. Um, informational, uh, all-inclusive, uh, ESCO models, coordination of ones. But the thing is that what is actually happening in Bulgaria is that uh, there are uh, the one-stop shops that are existing right now in Bulgaria are all informational. So the thing is that they're offering only information about certain activities, uh, certain opportunities that uh, uh, the house owners could, uh, could apply. Uh, and uh, all of these one-stop shops that are existing in Bulgaria right now are, um, they have an NGO involved in the process uh, in a certain way. And the thing is that uh, we have, uh, we are seeing, for example, um, Gabrovo, we are seeing Burgas, uh, because the thing is that uh, uh, 
certain NGOs in the country are working with these municipalities for quite a long time, for uh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, to educate them on the topics of energy efficiency. So the thing is that uh, the, the, this kind of partnerships are already existing, existing in Bulgaria. And actually, just because uh, we have such partnerships, we have one-stop shops in the country currently. And uh, such a, such one stop shops, uh, the one stop shops are basically um, supported uh, by uh, and funded by partly by these NGOs, partly by the municipalities. And the most important thing is to think how uh, a one stop shop could be uh, could be uh, sustainable in the long run, where the resources are going to come from. And the thing is that we we really don't know. And uh, currently, I, I really want to stress out it's that uh, the one-stop shops that are existing in Bulgaria are either financed by EU projects or financed um, partially uh, by NGOs and municipalities. So yes, this is short answer. Perfect. Thank you for your contribution then we have a question another one from anonymous at, at d um it's in bulgarian so i'm switching to bulgarian uh мислите, се пазар на тока, на който ще преобладават вейдата по енергийната бедност Не, <laughs> Едва ли той ще има възможност да оценява толкова динамично нещата, той ще бъде на годишна база, а, но със сигурност е някакъв гарант, че ще дигне доходни критерии при скачане на цените и че а, ще наложи организация на пазара или въвеждане на пазара в момент, в който той няма да накара всички българи да станат енергия на пет. Надяваме се, може би това също и причината да не се приема тази дефиниция, защото се очаква а, точно това да се получи. Разбира се. А, ако, а, а конкретно преобладаването на веитата много зависи кой ще ги притежава тези веита. Защото ако веитата са изцяло и само в ръцете на хора с доходи, а хората без доходи се налагат плащат таксите за мрежа и за всичко за инвестиции в мрежа, за да бъдат обързани тези веита. И тогава нещата ще бъдат още по-тежки за най-бедните хора. Така че искрено се не точно това, за това се борим и за това сме тук, за да поискаме с бъдещи програми, схеми за инсталиране на веи да се насочват само към енергийно бедните домакинства. И тази енергийна бедност да бъде дефинирана по един адекватен начин. В момента, когато ние все още нямаме дефиниция, считаме за... Аз говоря в множествено число, всъщност това е мое лично мнение. Просто знам, че е споделено от много хора с това така. Но а, смятам, че а, тези схеми а, и програми трябва дори да започнат с групата на получаващи целеви помощи за управление, които в момента се обсъждат от социалното министерство. Uh, ние нямаме чак толкова 10 000 вейта са предвидени по на състояване устойчивост. Не знам, мисля, че голяма част от тях бяха да вече са включени в първата фаза и с тях и при тях е изключено. Но следващите фази сметваме, че трябва да бъдат насочени точно към тази група. Знаем кои са, знаем къде са. Нека първо да решим проблема наистина на най-развимите, кто бъде прият след дефиниция. Защото ние нямаме опита да работим с тези групи хора и бъдещия пазар ще се отрази много за изключително. Благодаря. 
Добре, благодаря. Следващия въпрос, който ви е Пром Рая Лечева. Въпрос към госпожа Пенева. Каква е разликата между дефиницията, която определя 21% от българите да са енергийно бедни, или 35-40% да са енергийно бедни? Какви са предимствата на формулата за уязвими домакинства да се определят 35% от домакинствата? Има ли индикации скоро да се приета дефиницията у нас? Разликата е голяма. 21% от българите са по дефиниция, в която питат хората, вие считате ли се за енергийно баден? Може ли да си осигурите адекватно отопление през зимата? И те казват да или не. Не може да използваме такъв индикатор, за да измерваме енергийно бедност. Всеки един ще каже, че не може да си подсигури на адекватно отопление. Аз съм сигурна, че този индикатор е приложен. Абсурдно. Просто тогава трябва да са всички енергийно бедни. Той не е обективен. Това е Основната разлика. Той е неприложим. Практически неприложим. Не знам защо продължава все още да се използва. Наистина. Аз винаги съм отправила голяма критика към този индикатор. Да не говорим, че през 2010-2011 година в България той беше 67% от населението. Но явно доходите толкова са нараснали през тези 10 години, че сме успели три пъти да спаднем този процент. А предимствата на формулата тя не е... Значи има разлика между язвими клиенти и енергийно бедни домакинства. Това са две различни групи. Едните се дефинират за целите на инвестиции, а другите се дефинират за целите на защита при ливерализиран пазар, когато не трябва да им се прекъсва захранването през зимата за 2 или 4 месеца или пък когато е евентуално е възможно да бъде разработено някакво разрочено пластване. Разбира се, и двете мерки при наличието на фондове, които да гарантират ликвидността на енергийните доставчици. А, така че предимствата на тази формула, ако говорим за уязвими домакинства, те, техния обхват е много малък. Той е близък до сегашните обхвати, които на сегашната група, която е покрита от Социалното министерство, не само за помощи за отопление, за месечни помощи, хора, които получават интеграционни добавки за това, че са имат увреждания и така нататък. Така че тези групи са известни, покриват се по някакъв начин с някакви помощи. А вече другата група, по-голямата, предимствата на тази формула е, че ще може много по-бърз да е процеса на инвестиция и много по-реално да се подпомогне на хората, ако чакаме нали, при по-малка група всички останали да инвестират с частен ресурс, тези 20% ли са финансирани. Аз мисля, че няма как да се случи, това го казва бизнес. А индикации да бъде скоро прета дефиницията няма никакви. Абсолютно никакви. Трябва министър председател е запознат с проблема, доколкото разбирам от няколко източника. Ива Петрова, заместник министър на министерството, го спомена на една конференция на КНСБ преди две седмици. А, твърди се, че е запознат, но след като до момента той не е предприел действие да се заложи министерство отговорно за този проблем и то само за една информационна система. И след като така добре е разработената дефиниция, критерии, близо 10 страници и повече документ не е пусна за обществено обсъждане. Считам, че индикациите са нулеви. И така. Окей, okay, thank you. Uh, one last question from Vladimir Zinoviev. How do you see the situation for the main problem, connection to the grid for all the 10 kilowatt peak uh, households, photovoltaic project that will be realized within the resilience and recovery plan? Uh, so who would like to answer this one? Yes, maybe I could try to answer this very briefly. And uh, I don't see actually a solution of this problem. Uh, because the thing is that uh, um, this program uh, was designed without uh, prosumers uh, in mind. So the thing is that if you apply for such project, you can just use the energy generated for your own needs. You cannot really return it to the grid. So the thing is there is no going to be such connection 
to the grid uh, if you have an installation like that. And some people are going to say, okay, but why should I apply for, uh, for such thing if there we cannot uh, return um, the energy to the grid that we're not using? in our households. There is an option for batteries, which are, uh, of course, making uh, this more ex uh, expensive, the whole thing. But um, yes, uh, to, to, be, to be really brief, I don't see this problem being solved under the recovery and resilience plan, at least. If we uh, have uh, future projects for um, uh, local renewable energy sources in our households, maybe, we're going to have a different procedure, we're going to have different outcomes, and maybe we're going to have um, a definition for uh, prosumers of energy. But I don't see um, uh, Bulgaria having this definition, at least not in the next couple of years. Okay, uh, thank you, Svetlu. Uh, hopefully things will go in the positive direction uh, for you citizens and to Bulgarian citizens as well. Uh, so with this, we can uh, wrap up the webinar. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for your patience regarding the technical issue that we had uh, in the beginning. Then um, I would like to thank the panelists for being here with us, sharing their knowledge, experience on tackling energy poverty. Um, also, I would like to thank a lot to the interpreters that uh, they were here and they made it uh, available, uh, like possible, uh, for uh, people from different parts of the world to join uh, the webinar and uh, having it in two languages. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank uh, all of the participants that joined and for your questions as well, uh, which I'm sure that enriched uh, the session. Uh, later on, we'll send you a following email with a survey in which you can uh, fill out how uh, you think the, that webinar went. Uh, of course, it's an optional survey, uh, but feel free to give us feedback so that we can improve uh, the webinars. Uh, this is actually the first webinar of a series, uh, which will be the next two of them will be in September and October, focused on public finance and projects that are uh, related to environmental and social impact. So with that, um, we can finish this webinar. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Wish you a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>